Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, my dear sisters and my brothers. Here is part two from Al Hajj and Eid al Adha, the new meanings. Imagine if we were again commanded that each of us every year had to hunt for an alligator, for a lion, for an anything. How would that be? My dear sisters and my brothers and anyone who listens to my pep talk, there is a lot that we are measurably failing to fulfill towards Allah. And the mere act that we do not give Eid al-Adha its true meaning shows how far we truly, truly believe in the gifts of Allah. We are also showing Allah how far we are from the teachings of Al-Quran and how miserably we have settled for some unscrupulous and we are and have become accustomed to a version of Islam that is crafted by culture, politics, ignorance, and by the men of religion that are doing their best to keep the Quran's teachings away from us. So hopefully this year, we truly present our sacrifice here in England, where we live, as such act is the doing of our prophet. It is the sunnah to slaughter where you live. Paying charity so that your animal is delivered abroad has killed the spirit of thankfulness here in our homes in the West. It is said that Eid al-Adha has become more of a burden, more for pay, 100 pounds or something, or dollars or anything, and my duty is done. And I am happy that I don't have to do anything with that lamb. It's given somewhere else, and that's that. But the true meaning of Eid al-Adha has become so remote that its impact on our lives today is extremely minimal. So change your perception. Your intention, your aim, your goal, acknowledge the meat that you eat throughout the year, that it comes from animal that if they were made, if they were not made submissive, they would have eaten us. Consider Eid al-Adha like your yearly zakat, your yearly fast, the yearly thing that you do. Zakat, you save money, then you pay the zakat on it to purify your zakat. Think of Eid al-Adha like your yearly event where you purify the year eating of the meat. That, Ya Allah, I'm gracefully, I'm greatly acknowledging and extremely thankful for what you have given me throughout the year of this meat of the cattle and how you submitted them to us. And this is the time where I will sacrifice and offer something to you so that you accept it from me, the pious. And then you go eat it. The blood of what you have slaughtered, the meat of what you have slaughtered will not go up to Allah, but your piety, your acknowledgement, the feeling that you have in your heart, the humbleness, the power of acknowledging that what you got comes from Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see it through and he will reward you on that. You would never ever had the opportunity, my dear sisters and my brothers, to actually eat meat where it left to us. Imagine if you had to hunt for an eagle or a lion to have meat. That would never happen. So let's all be thankful this year and offer our sacrifices here in the United Kingdom or wherever you are. Eat your meat. Give it to your neighbors. Give it to your family and relatives. And let it be joy in your heart. When you look at your meat and you eat it, you say, this is my thankfulness to my Lord for allowing me throughout the year to have and be graced by these submitted animals that he only made it possible for me. That will get you a great number of rewards. So how best to show this act of gratitude? Because Eid al-Adha is an act of gratitude. There are three ways to truly express gratitude. Appreciativeness, gratefulness, and thankfulness to the true one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who honorably and greatly deserves all kinds and types of gratitude. Firstly, those who will go to the full length to show their gratitude, they go to Hajj. Because they go to Hajj, they travel, they endure, they get to Hajj, mention the name of Allah for days, and then they offer the sacrifice as the great sacrifice of appreciation. That is the top of it all. This is why you must perform Hajj ASAP.
And as for the whole number of days, they do totally nothing but mention the name of Allah. And they do it wholeheartedly, express their gratitude, and this is the crown dhikr that people at Hajj continuously vocalize. It's called the tarbiyah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. The term labbaik is taken from the laba in a place, meaning he dwells in a some place. And he dwells that in total obedience, meaning continuous obedience. So when you say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, what you are saying in a way, Ya Allah, here I am in Mecca, in this particular place, fully submissive, with full intent to only mention your name. And then you say to him again, with the same expression as I said, La sharika lak, you associate nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna alhamda, which is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the thankfulness, the praise and everything, wa ni'ma, every bounty is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also the kingdom of the absolute kingdom and ownership of everything that he has ever created, la sharika lakan. This is in Sahih Muslim. Those people who put their money, time, energy, health, comfort and safety at risk just to show their unconditional gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall receive great rewards only be known to Allah and those rewards shall be given to them on the day of rewards that is the day of al Qiyamah. That is the only day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you everything and only he knows the true reward. Nobody knows what reward you are going to get to Hajj. Please note that the Hajj is not a revival act, nor is a yearly celebration to what took place thousands of years before with Ibrahim alayhi salam. This is not how Islam functions. It is a yearly event that spreads over a few months, four months, when human beings from all earth head to the sacred house of the king, Allah, in response to an invite made by Ibrahim, alayhi salam, by the supreme order of Allah, the Almighty. And as I already said, it is so, so, so sad that Muslims today I have given to each and every station in Hajj a connection with what Prophet Ibrahim السلام, did the moment he had the vision till he was about to slaughter his son. And everything that happens in Hajj, they link it to what Ibrahim السلام, And then they say, oh, he threw the pebbles because shaitan came to him. And then he came to him second time and third time. And the Arafah is when he wanted to do this. And absolutely nonsense. There are no ayat in the Quran that speak about such nonsense events and how they link them to Hajj, nor authentic sunnah. All those are man-made non-existent explanations at all of facts. It actually has taken Hajj all the way from what has been, as Allah wants it in Al-Quran, to almost some fictional fairy tale stories. As Muslims, we really ought to update and upgrade our belief and understand and all those understanding about the true meaning of Hajj as Allah wants it in Al-Quran and as explained by his messenger, وسلم, not as our forefathers and general public have made us to believe in. Hajj is not a commemoration to honor the meaning of what took place between Ibrahim and Ismail or his son Ishaq. So this is the first kind of people that go to Hajj and give it all. There are the second type of people, those who for a reason or another couldn't make it to Hajj to show their full gratitude. This is where some acts are encouraged within a time frame. Within the first 10 days, because always remember, in the four months, when you go and perform the Hajj, you do it at individual level. But the 10 days of the Hijjah is an international celebration. This is why al Hajj al-Akbar, it's the whole Muslim world get together. If I choose to perform Hajj in the Al-Qaeda, in five days, in one week in the Al-Qaeda, nobody hears about me except me and Allah who knows this. But when it's in the 10 days of the Hijjah, it's a worldwide event. Those who go, 
they celebrate. But those who don't go, they don't sit with crossed arms. They actually get involved to support. It's almost like if I have to give an example here. If you have a, your country team that's going to play a soccer a game in World Wide Cup for football. So as the, your team or your country plays, you find that the whole country sits in front of television and they cheer up and they jump up and down if something happens. Why in spirit they support the team? The, uh, this is how it works. When our people, the Muslims that go to Mecca to celebrate, mention the name of Allah and celebrate Eid al-Adha as an act of gratitude and thankfulness for what Allah has given us of the cattle that we eat throughout the year, the rest of the Muslim world in the greatest of the Hajj, we support them. How do we support them? We copy them. We can't turn around the Kaaba. We can't. Do, so we start increasing the amount of the good deeds we do. And when they slaughter to thank Allah for an act of gratitude, we also slaughter throughout the world because we all are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he has given us. This is the spirit of the Hajj that Allah wants from us. And this is what Islam stands for. This is, it's almost like, look at it this way. We have a coin. One coin, that coin is called the gratitude coin. One side of the coin, people are in hajj and they perform hajj. I'm talking about the greatest hajj here in their hijjah, in these days of their hijjah. So they are in hajj, they perform the hajj, and then they slaughter the animal. The other side of the gratitude coin is the rest of the Muslim world. And this is where we have a gratitude coin. It has a head and tail. They are the head in Mecca. We are the rest of the world is the tail. This is why, my dear sisters and my brothers, the pilgrimage are totally dedicated to the purpose of their visit to the house of Allah. The rest of the Muslim world kind of supports them by carrying some acts that show total support. Now, since the majority of us aren't in Hajj, so what can we do to show our unity and play the other side of the coin to support what our brothers and sisters, the other side of the coin of gratitude, are doing in Hajj in Mecca? and to be in perfect harmony with them. And also the spirit of unshrinking and unflinching gratitude that we must show to Allah. So let us see what our messenger وسلم, recommend us to do. But before diving in, please remember that our messenger وسلم, would never ever recommend us to do something from himself without a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such is not given to him, and all that he does, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all says is nothing else but to obey what Allah commands in Al-Quran. And since Allah has mentioned in the Quran that as a single nation we should grandify Allah's rituals, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then pointed us towards what we could do to resemble our brothers and sisters in Al-Hajj. Allah says, ذلك وما يعظم شعائر الله فإنها من تقوى القلوب. This is again in Surah Al-Hajj, the Surah number 22, and this is the Ayah number 32. This is, or that is, and whosoever grandifies, magnifies in honor the rituals set by Allah, that is truly a manifestation of the piety in the heart. So when people are in Hajj observing this great gratitude event, and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, us, we must grandify these rituals. And how do we grandify this ritual of hajj and slaughter? We actually become more pious. And how do we become more pious? We increase the number of good deeds. This is why Rasulullah says, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ There are no days where the righteous deeds are so beloved to Allah than these days. The Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, Al-Jihad, fighting for the sake of Allah. That is giving your life for the sake of Allah. Rasulullah says, وَلَا الْجِهَادِ Not even that except a man who leaves his home with himself and his wealth and doesn't get back. Now, for the jihad doesn't mean you blow yourself up or you go invade a country. Here we're talking about the defensive jihad as it has been done by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this hadith is an Al-Bukhari. Here we see that this hadith is in harmony with the Quran. 
There are other variations of this hadith, but they all gravitate around the best days are the first 10 days of the hijjah. This is the greatest hajj, al-hajjul akbar. Akbar because the whole Muslim world is involved. The regular hajj is only individual. So whoever witnesses this time of the hajj should celebrate this hajj in a way that they can do that. You must also understand that there is a huge agreement between scholars that any deeds you do within these 10 days are an option. It's not obligatory. Nothing is obligatory on you to do within these days, even the fasting of the day of Arafah. So let us see what good deeds can we do. Well, as usual, people always do something vertical between them and Allah. Fasting, donating money, reading the Quran, increase salat, make more dhikr, and that's that. But are these the only good deeds that you can come up with? How about being honest? How about give testimony as commanded by Allah? If you see something and even your mother or your brother or your father are wrong, and the right is without the other person, then you testify against your parents. Can you do that? That's a great act of goodness that a lot of people don't look at. How about feed orphans and the poor where you live? I'm not talking abroad or sending it to your home country. How about sponsor a widow where you live? So many Muslims today in Europe, in the West, are not able to fulfill a lot of their own needs. How about put $500 or pounds in a, in a note and go give it through the letterbox to these people and say, Eid is coming, enjoy your Eid. How about visiting sick people in hospitals and houses? And that is for Muslims and non-Muslims. Be good to mankind. How about proactively do something good and beneficial in the community where you live? How about thousands of ideas? How about and how about anything good that is beneficial to the community is far more rewardful than just you fasting the 10 days of Arafah or reading the Quran. We have to come out of that shell of being egocentric. We must think as a broader community. Before dealing with cutting the hair and trimming the nails and things like that, I want first speak about the term Qurbani that a lot of people use these days and they take it for granted. The word Qurbani is derived from the root word of Qarraba and that is to bring it near, to bring something closer to you, near you. So, when they say Qurbani, they refer to the sacrifice that we offer in al Eid al-Adha. But, however, Qarraba also means offer something as a token to gain nearness to the one offered to. For example, when someone slaughters an animal to an idol, so they get closer to it. That's called Qurbani. But the term Qurbani does not exist, in fact, in Arabic. Qarraba Qurbanan. But there is nothing called Qurbani. This is more of a Urdu or some uh, Indian subcontinent translation of the word Qarraba Qurbanan. They call it Qurbani. And as such, it has become kind of like an international word. Allah says about the two children of Adam, Ith Qarraba Qurbanan. They both brought forth an offering, a sacrifice. So please call it Udhiyah. For all it matters, that's how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam calls it. After all, it's called the Eid al-Adha, not Eid al-Qurbani now. So many of you asked about what's to be done if one intends to sacrifice an animal and precisely when it comes to cutting or trimming one's hair and their nails. As in, you go to your styling, to the hairdresser, or for ladies to have a manicure or a pedicure within the 10 days of the hijjah. Some also inquired about the validity of sacrificing on behalf and for our Prophet ﷺ. And I shall cover this point right after I finish off with these nails and hair trimming or cutting. Before going into the ahadith, first let's consult the primary and chief source of our religion, Al-Quran. So first and foremost, the primary and supreme source of evidences of the law that is Al-Quran mentions nothing of such a practice, and that is not cutting your hair or trimming your hair or nails. It doesn't exist at all in the Quran.
As such, it is safe to say that this act is not compulsory because, as I already said, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would never ever preach something without Allah's revelation because throughout the Quran, the command is as clear as the shining of a diamond under a midsummer day full of sun. Listen to this. Allah says in the Quran as a command to Rasulullah وَاتَّبِعْ مَا يُوحَى إِلَيْكَ and this is in Surah Yunus, the number 10, and the Ayah 109, i.e., and follow closely. Ittabi does not have the same meaning as itba. Itba is physically follow one after the other, like a human follows the other one. But ittabi is really to investigate what the other person has gone, and you put your footstep on their footstep. What Allah has commanded Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, i.e., follow as closely as possible the commands of Allah in the Quran. This is why our mother Aisha radiallahu anha in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, when she was asked about the character of Rasulullah, who he was, she said, خُلُقُهُ كَانَ خُلُقُهُ الْقُرْآنِ Who he was, he was the Quran, he was a walking Quran. And that is the beauty of this great man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what has been revealed to him is the Quran. And we Muslims are also commanded the same as our messenger. Listen to what Allah graced us with beautifully. He says, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم i.e. close, it's the same command, like he gave it to Rasulullah, he gave it to us. اتبعوا, ليس اتبعوا. اتبعوا, as I said, is physical fellowship. But اتبعوا is really you investigate and you put your footstep on that person's footstep. So closely, very closely follow that which has been descended upon you from your Lord. And that is Al-Quran. And then Allah warns us, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَا And do not follow any leaders or preachers, others that preach or preach else than Al-Quran. Little do you recall, because humans today, when you tell them Allah says in Al-Quran, or when you ask an evidence, or you tell them, does the Quran say something about that? They straight away start labeling you, you are a Qur'ani person. Like you only accept the Qur'an, as if accepting only the Qur'an has become a shame. Sadly, so it is our state today. Alhamdulillah, I do not reject the Sunnah, but as I said it 1,000 times before, I only accept the Hadith where it does not contradict the Qur'an, that is absolutely fantastic, or the ahadith where Rasulullah Sallallahu explains something in Al-Quran. For example, we perform salat because he said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, perform your salat as you saw me performing my salat. Since we don't know how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi performed the, his salat, we listen to what people who saw him. That's why your child sees you perform the salat. Even if you tell him nothing or you tell her nothing, they will learn how to perform the salat. But that is a subject for another day. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared something in Al-Quran. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in attabi'u illa ma yuha ilay. This is in Surah Al-An'am, the number six, the ayah 50. I only close, follow that which has been revealed unto me. So if the followed book of Allah doesn't mention the law against trimming the hair and nails, where did this act come from? Would Rasulullah come up with something that Allah didn't tell him to? Well, as it turned out, it is a hadith reported by Muslim, Abu Dawood, At-Tirmidhi, Ibn Hibban, Al-Bayhaqi, and many others books of the hadith, and the hadith is authentic. And since it is not a Quranic law, the scholars and school of thoughts have differed on the issue into three distinctives opinions. And the problems we face today is that the school of thought that is prevalent in these days because of wealth, and that is the Wahhabi or the Saudi Arabia school of thought, they make it seem because they will only promote their point of view and hide and belittle the other points of view. This is where the problems occur in the world today. And as I said before, this version of Islam does not work. It's causing us a lot of headache because the Saudi Islam is only to support, protect the government, and obviously to individualize people. But in any way, this is a topic for another day. Let me go with the first opinion, and this is the people who say it is haram to touch your hair and your nail. 
And they say, anyone who wants or intends to sacrifice is under the obligation. And they say haram, even though it's not in the Quran, but uh, what can we say? They say, is under the obligation. And as such, they must avoid trimming any nails or hair. It's a compulsory deed. In fact, they even issue the ruling of it being haram to trim any hair or nail within the 10 days of the hijjah. This opinion is held and observed by the Hanbali school of thought. And the Hanbali school of thought is what happens in Saudi Arabia. This means Saudi Arabia and its likes. And one thing here before I move on, the school of thought Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal or uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal is actually not a true school of thought because Ahmed ibn Hanbal was not a faqih. He was not a man of fiqh. He was a man of hadith. It's only later on that it became a school of thought. I'll reserve this to the day I deal with this and the likes topics, inshallah, in the near future. This is also the opinion of some scholars from the past, such as Ishaq ibn Rahawi. These scholars maybe might not mean too much to you, but just in case somebody from the other side of the fence listens to my talk, he will will see that I am also bringing the scholars, the great scholars of the past. In any way, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, as I said, Ibn Hazm alayhi rahmatullah, al-Imam al-Awza'i, and so is also Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib in one of his arguments, because there are contradictory uh, arguments about what this man and other scholars have said. So these are the scholars, and they date from the first century of uh, our uh, Muslim calendar. So Saudi Arabia and the rest of who follows their teachings, they will tell you it's haram and everything that goes around that corner. But in any way, the second opinion, they say it is preferable not to trim or, uh, your hair or your nails, but it is just disliked to touch them. This is the opinion of the Maliki school of thought and also a second opinion of an Imam Shafi. It seems like an Imam Shafi at one point he said it's haram and then he changed his mind that it is just preferable. And also is a second opinion of the Hanbali school of thought. So it looks in Saudi Arabia, they went to the hardest bit and they didn't want to take the second opinion of uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal where he said it's only preferable and not compulsory. So as the opinion of Al-Hassan al-Basri who is a great scholar uh, and of the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he holds that it's preferable and not uh, and it's disliked just to touch them. What they mean by disliked is like makruh. You don't get a sin for doing it. It's not good, but you don't get a sin for doing it. The third opinion, they say it's permissible to trim your hair and trim your nails. And this, they say, it's totally permissible for any who intends and wishes to sacrifice in the 10 days of the hijjah, the end of it, to trim their hair and nails as they please, with no compulsion to do so or likability. If you don't want to do it, just don't do it. This is the opinion of the Hanafi school of thought. Uh, for your information, the Hanafi school of thought is cursed in Saudi Arabia. Abu Hanifa is classified in Saudi Arabia as a disbeliever. That's why the Hanafi people, they call it al Imam al adam the magnificent Imam, to retaliate to all those evil statements that are issued. And there are books written against him in Saudi Arabia in our 21st century. Believed or not, but it exists and it's in Arabic. But in any case, so so Imam Abu Hanifa, the school of thought, they say it's permissible. And so also is the point of view of a Laith Ibn Sa'd. The Laith Ibn Sa'd, he was more knowledgeable than Imam Malik. And a few other scholars, it's just subhanAllah, his school of thought didn't take off. Again, it's also the point of view of Ata ibn Abi Rabah, a great scholar. Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, Aydan, it's a great scholar of all. Tawus ibn Kaysan, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad, and Sa'id ibn Musayyib, and many, many, many others. They say it is permitted to touch your hair or do anything as you please, and there are no remorse, no sins whatsoever. So they what are the arguments that they use for you must and permit it? Because these are kind of like it's black and white. It's Again, this is where we don't have the Quran and the Hadith kicks in alone. <laughs> we never reach stability in anything. Well, they used an argument by Ummu Salama radiallahu anha, one of the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, and only Allah knows uh, if he said that or not. But in any case, 
the hadith says إذا رأيتم هلال ذي الحجة if you see the hijjah's crescent like in these days here وأراد أحدكم أن يضحي and any of you wants to sacrifice to offer أضحية فليمسك عن شعره وأظافره let him not touch his hair and his nails and this is in Sahih Muslim and uh, the Hanbali or the, the Saudi or the likes of scholars they say whenever the Prophet gives a command it is a must and when he forbids something it is haram whatever it is in Al-Quran or not but this is not accepted by the majority of the scholars thus the disagreements about point of view and the headaches we have today but the scholars this hadith has said is by Sahih Muslim but the scholars responded saying this prohibition is only to show dislike not tahrim not total prohibition since we have nothing that points out to tahrim he didn't say it's haram to do, do that or you mustn't he said فليمسك. let him withhold from cutting his nails and his hair that's all there is to it it's like you tell your child who is on the floor uh, don't sit on the floor it doesn't mean it's haram just don't do it it's, it's just don't do it that's all there is to it and the they say, since we have nothing that points out to the tahrim, then it is not prohibited. The prohibitors insist that since it is an authentic hadith, then it is a law and it obviously must be followed. They don't mention that the hadith is only an estimate. We are not, as I said 100 times, when we say this is a hadith, we absolutely have no guarantee that it actually truly came from Rasulullah. We don't. It's only an assumption. It's a possibility. And only Allah knows the truth. That's why we use the Quran as the reference and it is far safer. But in any way, let us move now to the second group. They say it's preferable with no obligation. This group used another hadith that is reported in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. So it's far more stronger than Umm Salama. And in the weight of a hadith, this second hadith is far more weighty and powerful than that of Umm Salama. Where our mother Aisha radiallahu anha says, كنت أفتل قلائد هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Our mother Aisha used to hand roll the necklaces to be put around the neck of those cattle animals that were to be sacrificed in Hajj. This is just to make them uh, a point that that animal with that uh, thing around the neck, necklace around the neck, are al-hadi, i.e. the gifts that are going to be offered in al-hajj. And then she said, radiallahu anha, ثُمَّ يُقَلِّدُهَا بِيَدِهِ Then the Rasulullah Sallam would take all those necklaces that she handmade, and then he would, sallallahu alayhi wasallam go to these animals, and he personally put them around their neck one by one. ثُمَّ يَبْعَثُ بِهَا Then he sends it to Al-Kaaba, to Mecca, to sacrifice. And then she said something extremely important. That's always, subhanAllah, how these scholars keep these things away. What for? Politics are, are, are a deadly disease. And then she says, وَلَا يُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِ شَيْءٍ And he does not prohibit on himself something أَحَلَّهُ اللَّهُ له That Allah has made halal for him حَتَّى يَنْحَرَ الْهَدِي Till he slaughters the gifted animals. I.e., from the time Rasulullah puts the necklaces around the neck of these animals, sends them to Al Kaaba, and he would not prohibit on himself something that Allah has made halal. So, cutting the nails is halal, cutting the hair is halal. Would Rasulullah make them haram on him in these 10 days? This hadith in Al Bukhari and Muslim says no, and he doesn't prohibit on himself anything that Allah has not made haram on him in Al Quran. And as I said, we do not have in the Quran anything that says the hair or the nails must not be touched. And as such, the other people that, that say it's preferable, if you want to do it, it's good. You know, you don't expect big rewards out of it. You don't know if you're going to get rewards or not. It's good. And if you don't want to do it, it's no harm. The third point of those Hanafi school of thought, they say this is a non-existent thing. You don't even need to do anything. And I personally, Abdul Salam, Abu Hanifa, I go with the third point of view. You do not have to do what they say, not to touch your hair or trim your uh, nails. You can trim your nails and you can cut your hair as you please. If someone tells you, tell them the hadith is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, since they don't accept the Quran uh, by itself. So this puts, inshallah, this issue of cutting the hair and nail 
at ease for all that is to come, inshallah, in future years. But please remember that the hair and nails remain a matter of choice, not an obligation, and such is the beauty of our Islam. When you put something, when you filter through the Quran, the truth always shines. No matter how hard they try, or one party tries to hide it, once you are, look, the disease is this. When you go to a school of thought, like in Saudi Arabia, and they hide everything else, they just make you think like that's only the argument. Don't, 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 don't. And you get, and when you don't understand something, you get confused. Why it's like that? Because they have hidden the other evidences. Wouldn't it have been better if they put all the three options in front of you and you choose? You can do this, you can do this, and you can do that. It's like on a motorway or a highway or something. You've got three lanes. If you want to be the top of the achievers, take the far right lane. If you want to be so-so, take the middle lane. And if you want to easy go and take it, go for the minimum of what Islam wants from you, go to the left lane. But in Saudi Arabia and the Salafi and all these type of people, they want us all drive on the far right, the sixth right lane. We can't do that. Give us the beauty of Islam, not the whole horrible thing of the school of thoughts. And now I move on to the last point here is offering a sacrifice on behalf of the prophet. There is a very strange belief that is floating around about, especially in the Indian subcontinent, where people believe that to show their love to the prophet, they slaughtered an animal for him. So does this act have some reason to exist? Does our Prophet ﷺ need our sacrifice? And if we want to thank him, what's the best way? Sadly, as usual, we Muslims are great at putting the Qur'an behind our back. Then go conceive and follow a lot of nonsense, one of which is to offer a sacrifice on behalf of our Prophet as a token of gratitude. Believe it or not, the Qur'an has told us how to reward our Prophet, how to thank him, how to show appreciation, and finally acknowledge his great good deeds for us. Let me put your heart at rest. Our Prophet ﷺ has made it. He's going to go to Jannah undoubtedly. It's a thousand time percent he is going to Jannah. All his sins have been forgiven. All his good acts are increasing. Every time you and I and the gazillion of humans pray, he gets 100% of our rewards without affecting ours. Allah loves him. The malaika loves him. Rasulullah is extremely the richest man on earth today when it comes to good deeds. He doesn't need you to slaughter an animal on his behalf. What he wants from you is to follow him. Follow what he has brought to you, the Qur'an. So, you want to thank him? Then here is how to thank him. How Allah says in Al-Qur'an, we must thank him. Strangely enough, how to thank our Prophet ﷺ is in Al-Qur'an. And before I jump into that, I will say this. Anyone who slaughters an animal to thank Rasulullah, Anyone who thanks Rasulullah in a different of different ways is actually disobeying Allah and getting a sin. Here is how. In Surah Ash-Shura, and that is the Shura number 42, i.e. the Surah number 42, in the Ayah 23, open your Quran in Arabic, if you can read Arabic, if you cannot open the Quran still, in Surah 42, Ayah 32, and you are going to see this beautiful Ayah. قل لا أسألكم عليه أجر say no reward do I ask of you this is our prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم speaking to us say لا أسألكم عليه أجر no reward do I ask of you for this whatever he has brought to us what he has done for us رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم saying I don't want any reward from you nothing don't give me nothing إلا except that hustle. This is, I don't want nothing from you except this. And pay attention to what Rasulullah wants us to do to thank him. 
and look at how the Muslim world today and for the last 1400 years has done nothing but being ungrateful to Rasulullah for what he has done to us. And then he said something extremely shivering, extremely scary. And here it is, except to be kind to my kin, those close to me. When Rasulullah was in Al Madina before he died, those that were close to him, his kin, were Fatima, Ali, Al Abbas, his uncle, Al Hassan, and Al Hussein. These are the household of Rasulullah. And there is another part of the household, and there are his wives. But Rasulullah is the wives, their case is taking Rasulullah in the Quran. Allah has made them haram to marry, and that's that. But here Rasulullah is asking us, if you want to be grateful to me, if you want to thank me, if you want to do anything for me, I demand one thing from you. And that is al-mawadda. Al-mawadda is tenderness, love, affection to the kin of Rasulullah Let me tell you something. How much do you know about Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah Do you know that Fatima was transgressed against by some of the Sahaba? Do you know that Fatima, and I, I'm not a Shia or anything, this is in Al-Bukhari, Muslim in our books, but you don't get to hear this stuff. They keep it away from you because we have a very dark, bad past, sadly so. Very politicized, Bani Umayyah type of Islam that is today and still insists on protecting the people of Bani Umayyah. Do you know that Fatima radiallahu anha disagreed with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and she didn't speak to him for six months until she died? because of the inheritance of Rasulullah and a few other things, mistakes that Abu Bakr did, radiallahu anh, did with her, with Fatima, and she never liked him, she never spoke to him, she, all that kind of stuff until she died, radiallahu anh. Ali, radiallahu anh, when Abu Bakr was elected as a Khalifa, Ali didn't speak to Abu Bakr for six months until Fatima died, and he didn't pledge his allegiance to Abu Bakr until after six months. Ali radiallahu anha, how much do you know about Ali? Today the Shia are making a big hoo-ha about Ali and Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein and Fatima. Do you know why? Because before the birth of the Shia, and again, I am not saying that the Shia are my people, and Alhamdulillah, I'm of the Sunnah 100%, but the truth must be told. The Shia in the early days of Al-Islam, they didn't exist. It's only later, after every Muslim turned against Ali, that a group of Shia, Shia means the, of the party. So here we have the conservative party. If I say you are the Shia of the conservative party, what I'm saying is you are part of the conservative party. It doesn't mean anything bad. Allah has used this in the Quran and it doesn't mean at all anything bad. But when they call themselves the Shia, what they meant is those people who support Ali. Ali that has been forsaken, abandoned, and betrayed by the people of Ahl Sunnah. Do you know Ali, radiallahu anha, is a boy that was brought up by Rasulullah sallallahu A boy that embraced Islam when he was six years old, who lived in the household of Rasulullah sallallahu in Mecca who saw Rasulullah suffering. He walked and he prayed with Ali, uh, with Rasulullah in a Shi'ab outside in the open. He went with Rasulullah to different places to give da'wah. Ali is the young man that slept in the bed of Rasulullah when Rasulullah migrated. Ali is the young man that Rasulullah trusted with all the goods of people so that Ali returns them to, uh, to the people. Ali, who knows, subhanAllah al-haq. Then when he migrated to al Madina, he married Fatima. Ali, this great man, do you know how many hadith are that we have about Ali? We have 50 hadith, five zero. In Al-Bukhari and Muslim, the total of the hadith narrated by Ali are 23. The rest are scattered here. Abu Huraira, who embraced Islam in the year six, he only lived with Rasulullah three years and a half has not thousands upon thousands of hadith. And Ali, you know how much we have lost about the life of Rasulullah If we sat down with Ali and asked him, Ya Ali, tell us about how Rasulullah lived in Mecca. He will tell us since he was six to until he is 60. Ali could have told us 54 years of history. 
But Ali has been abandoned, has been betrayed and stabbed in the back, just like he has been killed and is today, still until today, nobody wants to talk about Ali. Every time you open your mouth, what has happened? They tell you, we don't talk about what happened about the Sahaba. It's something that happened. You know what? This is a big betrayal because what happened about the Sahaba, the Shia are going to eat us alive because of that. A lot of the conflicts in the world today happen is because of these unresolved issues. Al Hassan, the, the, the grandson of Rasulullah, killed, poisoned. Al Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, killed, decapitated. Is this the love that we show to Rasulullah? Instead of being kind to his people, this is how we are. If you want to thank Rasulullah, then love Fatima, love Ali, love Al Hassan. Love Al Hussein, love Al Abbas, love the offspring of these great people, love them and get to know them, get to know how they have been betrayed. I will cover the story of Ali, radiallahu anha. You know the story of Ghadir Khum, the oasis of Khum, after Rasulullah performed the last Hajj and he was coming back to Mecca. 90 days after that, Rasulullah died in that oasis where he gathered over a hundred thousands of the companions and he, Rasulullah held the hand of Ali up in the sky. He had his hand and holding, and he says, Man kuntu waliya, whoever I am, the nearest to him and his responsible, fa'ali mawlah. And Ali is, it's almost like Rasulullah is telling people, when I die, appoint Ali as your leader. That's why Ali radiallahu has been betrayed. And that's why there is a big bitterness in the world today because the household of Rasulullah has seen anything except what the Quran has told us to do, illa al-mawaddata fil qurba, except tenderness in the next to kin to Rasulullah These people, until today, we know nothing about them. The household of Rasulullah is so marginalized. So, and you know why Ummuna Aisha, you know we say Rasulullah married nine women, so we know about his life. Why do we know a lot about our mother Aisha radiallahu anha and very, very little about the other wives because our mother Aisha was a pro-Muawiyah. Anyone who was pro-Muawiyah in the time of the Bani Umayyah, they were put first in the books of Hadith scholars. Anyone who was against Muawiyah was either killed and betrayed. And so was Sa'd ibn Abi al-Waqqas radiallahu anha, a cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and, 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 and then the story goes on. These days, if you support the household of Rasulullah, they call you a Shia. When in fact, in Al-Quran, Allah says, إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةَ Except to be kind, tender, loving, appreciative to my kin, those close to me. This is what you should do for Rasulullah not offer him a sacrifice. I pray to Allah the Almighty that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, will enable us to understand the true meaning of what he has given us these days, and that we should not link our relation to the past. Al-Islam comes from an alive God, that is Allah, to alive people that are us through an alive book, that is Al-Quran. If we destroyed everything on earth today except the Quran, Al-Islam survives, Al-Islam lives, Al-Islam is still the book to mankind. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this talk will open your eyes to further, further realities, truths, and in-depth elements that are out there. Some of them are still kept hidden from you. But the more you know about the other side of the coin, the better it is and the more beautiful Islam becomes. Again, as usual, this is your brother Abdul Salam Abu Hanifa. If you want to join my group, please do send me a message on, uh, on the phone or WhatsApp. My telephone number is plus four four seven eight seven six four zero eight seven three five i pray to allah to forgive all of our sins bless us all and make us of the dwellers of the jannah with our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the great companions abu bakr omar uthman ali and everybody else that has come and lived with rasulullah but didn't change after the death of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam there are great companions out there we don't know much we know probably five ten of them but there are thousands of them many of them have contributed greatly and to those and everyone else that is pious, we say we salute you.
and pray to Allah to join us all together in the house of Al-Jannah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.